Testing one, two. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Praise God for our <clears throat> special music that was sung to us this evening. I want to welcome each and every one of you. Thank you for coming out to our Daniel and Revelation seminar this evening. <clears throat> and I hope everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear me? All right. Before we begin, why don't we um, just pause for a word of prayer and uh, let's invite God's presence to be with us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for this beautiful evening. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us together tonight to study your word. <laughs> Father, we want to invite your presence to be with us. We invite your Holy Spirit especially to be our true teacher this evening. And Father, we just want to ask, Lord, that Jesus would be lifted up this night. I pray, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross and that you would speak through me. And Father, we know, Lord, that the enemy hates this message. But Father, you are stronger than the enemy. And we know that Michael will fight for us. And so, Father, thank you so much, Lord, for never giving up upon us and for always pursuing us with your love, your mercy, and your grace. Please be with us now, Lord, as we open your word and as we have our quiz tonight. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to start off with our quiz, our quiz for tonight. If you have answered the question before in the past, you are exempted from taking the quiz. So how many of you guys are ready for the quiz tonight? Amen? All right. Oh, loud and clear. All right. Let's go to the first question. Whoever answers the question right, they will receive a gift from um, Renz. Renz has the gift. And if you can come up to the microphone, and share your answer to everyone, uh, we will give that gift to you. All right, let's start off with the first question. The first question, why did John weep much in Revelation 5 verse 4? Why did John weep much in Revelation 5 and verse 4? Any hands? All right, we have someone. Why did John weep much in Revelation 5 and verse 4? I'm sorry? Okay, good job, because no one could open the scroll. Give her a hand. You, guys, you can give her um, the, pre the prize. So the answer to this question is that no one was found worthy to open, read, or look at the scroll. So no one was found worthy. Good job. All right, let's go on to our second question. Who was found worthy to open the scroll and loose its seven seals? Jesus, correct. Good job. All right, we'll give her a prize. <clears throat> According to Revelation 5, verse 5, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, that's Jesus, and the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. The one who was worthy to open it was Jesus. Amen? All right, number three. In Revelation 5, verse 6, what does it mean that the seven spirits of God was sent out into all the earth? What does it mean that the seven spirits of God was sent out into all the world? I'm going to show you the, the verse on the screen so everybody can look, Revelation 5 verse 6. <laughs> so here's the question. 
What does it mean that the seven spirits of God was sent out into all the earth? According to this verse, what does it mean that it was sent out? Does anybody have a, a guess or an answer? Anyone? Is this a hard question? Yeah? Is there anyone that would like to attempt it? Any hands? Okay. This might be a more uh, advanced question because we didn't actually answer it last night. But I'm going to show you what it means. So we're not going to give away a prize tonight. We're just going to, I'm just going to simply answer the question. So here's the question. What does it mean that the seven spirits of God was sent out into all the earth? If you look at this verse, you're going to see that Jesus comes to the scene. The elders, there's, the elders saw that there stood a lamb as though it had been what everyone? Slain. What does the word slain mean? Pad Thai, right? Pad Thai, he, as if he had died. <clears throat> but the lamb is found in heaven. The lamb represents who, everyone? Jesus, who died on earth? It was Jesus that died on earth. And it says that the lamb was found in heaven. Now, when Jesus is found in heaven, he had just been crucified. And it also means that he just been resurrected to heaven. Now, when Jesus comes to heaven, it says that it had seven horns and seven eyes. Last night, we learned that seven, seven horns and seven eyes represent the all-knowing Jesus, right? All knowledge, all wisdom of Jesus. And then it says, which are the seven spirits of God. This word seven spirits is a term used to represent the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit of God was sent out into how many of the earth? What is this event in Bible history? What is the event of God's Holy Spirit being sent out into all the earth? It's Pentecost. Amen? It's Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell down upon the 12 disciples and as a result, they turned the world upside down. That's the first church, the apostolic church. Does that make sense, everyone? So when it says that the seven spirits, the seven spirits just is simply reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was sent out into all the earth. You remember when Jesus said that uh, if I do not go to heaven, I will not send you the helper. You guys remember that verse? That helper represents the Holy Spirit. Meaning to say, when Jesus went up to heaven in 31 AD, that same year when Jesus went up to heaven, the Holy Spirit was sent out into all the earth. That is known as the early rain. Does that make sense, everyone? And what year did the early rain come upon this earth? 31 AD, the day that Jesus resurrected from heaven, the year that Jesus resurrected to heaven. Does that make sense, everyone? Isn't this beautiful? Now, you don't see it, but you have to really read through it, and you need the spiritual eyeglasses in order to understand. So here's the answer. This verse shows that after Jesus resurrected from the earth, and ascended to heaven, since Jesus was found worthy to open the scrolls and the seals, Jesus was now able to pour out His Holy Spirit, His what everyone? His Holy Spirit onto this earth. This is known as the early rain slash the day of Pentecost. Can you say amen? Amen. All right. Are we all ready to study now? 
Why don't we pause for a short word of prayer before we begin again? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for being with us, for calming the rains, calming the storms, so that we could learn and understand your message this evening. Father, this is the message that the enemy hates the most. And so, Father, we plead for your presence. We plead for your Holy Spirit to be present here this evening. May you surround us with your angels and give us wisdom from on high, give us understanding, and give us tailor make this message to each and every individual this evening. Father, hide me behind the cross and may Jesus be lifted up. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our message this evening is entitled Star Wars. We're going to be looking at the great controversy in heaven. This is the most. Uh, this is the, the message that one, that one of the messages that Satan hates the most. I know tonight in our schedule, it was supposed to be um, the seals of God, but uh, some events happened, some events took place, and we were led to uh, share about the great controversy, especially this evening. So I hope you'll be blessed um, by this message. All right, are we ready to study, everyone? The great controversy is found in Revelation chapter 12. You can open up your Bibles and start looking in there with me. In Revelation chapter 12, you find there is a great war or a great controversy that takes place. Now, when you understand the great controversy, how does this relate to us today? You know, right now, what, what are we facing? What in pandemic are we facing, everyone? COVID-19, right? That's the big pandemic. and. Within this COVID-19, there are a lot of people who have been suffering or have been uh, dying. There's not just the pandemic, but there's also violence. There is murder. There is theft. There is all kinds of stealing, lying, cheating, divorce, broken marriages, broken relationships. There's all these things that are going on in this world. And the question that we have in mind is why? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is all of these things happen? How many of us have ever lost a loved one before? Isn't it hard to, to lose a loved one? It's not easy losing a loved one. And sometimes you're probably asking yourself, why does this happen to, to me? And why even now? Why do I have to struggle through this pain and this suffering and all these things and the reason I believe is because of sin because of sin and because there's this thing called the great controversy did you know that according to Ephesians it tells us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and rulers of all the darkness did you know that there is a great controversy going on in this world today. You and I cannot see this great controversy going on even to today. I mean, how many of us have ever looked up in the sky and said, hey, that's Satan and that's Jesus and they're fighting. Nobody has ever saw Jesus, right? Nobody, I mean, except for the disciples here on earth, but no one has ever seen Satan before and Jesus fighting in the midst of heaven, right? Meaning to say the great controversy is a spiritual battle that we can't see to the naked eye. Does that make sense, everyone? And what is this battle about? What is this great controversy about? Why are we having these wars, these calamities, these destruction, this sin? Why is all these things happening to us this evening? We're going to find some answers. We're going to look back at the origin of evil. The what, everyone? the origin of evil meaning where did evil start where did evil begin did god create the devil did god create satan or did god create a perfect uh, angelic being we're going to find out this evening as we study in our study this evening and the reason why the great controversy is so important is because the great controversy is not just a battle between God and Satan, but the battle is over you. It's over who, everyone? It's over us. It's over you and I. You see, this battle is so 
great, is so mighty, of course we can't even see it, but if we make the wrong decisions in life, it would lead to us going further and further away from God or perhaps going closer to God. Meaning to say, at the climax of the great controversy, you and I have a decision to make. Amen? You and I have a choice to make. Now, the reason why we have a choice to make is because there are two beings that is in contention for our souls. It's between God and Satan. Who is it between? God and Satan over us, over his people. Now, the reason why this is important is because whoever controls the what, everyone? The mind controls the thoughts, actions, and feelings. Our thoughts, actions, and feelings develop into what, everyone? Our habits. Our habits then lead into our character, and our character determines our destiny. This is very important in the great controversy because if whoever controls the mind controls your destiny. Does that make sense, everyone? Whoever controls the mind controls the thoughts, controls the actions, controls the feelings, controls your habits, controls your character, and as a result, it, it determines where will you be in the end. Does that make sense, everyone? Notice what, uh, notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The Bible says, In whom the who, everyone? The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. By the way, the God of this world is representative of who, everyone? That's Satan. Satan has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is, in the, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And then in verse 6, we, we all know this song. Let's read it together on the screen. Ready, go. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Satan knows that for each and every one of us, he wants to prevent us from having the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. In other words, he wants us to prevent, he, he wants to prevent us from knowing Jesus Christ. That is the great controversy. But at the same time, on the other hand, God reveals his light to shine out of what everyone darkness and he has shined that light where everyone in our in our hearts god wants to simply control our hearts and our minds because he knows what is at stake because whoever controls the mind controls the final destiny of man can you say amen Amen. All right. So we're going to study. We're going to ask some key questions as we look in Revelation chapter 12. The first question that we have on the screen is, where did war begin and who were the contenders? Where did this great controversy or this war begin and who were the contenders? Well, the Bible gives us an answer. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 8, the Bible says, And there was war at AUP. Does the Bible say at AUP? Although it feels like there is war right now. <laughs> there is war, where everyone? In heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Now, when you look at this verse, what is or who is involved in the great battle or the great controversy? Who are the two figures? You have Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels. So you have Michael, his angels, and dragon and the angels. Now there's something interesting. I want to look at the word war here. Do you, does anybody know what this word war means in, in the Greek? Did you know that the word war in Greek is the word what, everyone? Polemos, which means strife, 
quarrel, dispute, or argument. This war was a conflict of what everyone? Ideas, beliefs, and wills. It was not a physical war in heaven. There was no bloodshed in heaven. There was no killing in heaven. This war, according to the Greek, is the word polemos, which just simply means strife, quarrel, dispute, or argument. Have you ever had an argument before? Have you ever had an argument with your family members or perhaps your classmates? What do you do when you get into an argument? Sometimes, if you're not guarded, that argument can turn into a fight, sometimes a fist fight. But we see, according to the Greek, there was no fist fight in heaven. There was no bloodshed in heaven. There was no uh, shedding of blood in heaven. This war just simply means there was a dispute. There was an argument, and the argument was over God's ideas, God's belief, and God's will versus Satan's will. Does that make sense, everyone? So this word in Greek, polemos, just simply means an argument, dispute, strife, or quarrel. Now we need to ask, <clears throat> now notice what it says here. In Revelation 12, 17, here's the recap. The war began where, everyone? <clears throat> in heaven, it was between Michael and the dragon. Now here's the next question. Who is Michael? How do we know it's Jesus? Here, here are the verses. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, Michael fights against the dragon. Revelation 12, 9, Michael casts out Satan from heaven. Jude 1, 9 says that Michael contends. And then later on it goes, My Michael resurrects. Michael resurrects again. Michael came to help. Michael upholds and Michael delivers. When you, if you were to summarize the word Michael in one name and how it represents God, you could just simply say that Michael represents Jesus in his war mode. In his what, everyone? His war mode. In other words, his battle mode. Every time you see the word Michael, it's Jesus fighting for his people. Can you say amen? It's Jesus fighting for God's law. It's Jesus fighting to resurrect Moses, his chosen servant, from the grave. It's Jesus who, res who resurrects his people at the second coming of Jesus. It's Jesus who comes to help the angel Gabriel. And it's Jesus who delivers his people from the time of trouble. Can you say amen? According to these verses, Michael is simply a name used to refer to Jesus when he fights contends, helps, stands up for, resurrects, and defends his people. Is that good news? This is who Michael was, or who Michael is. Now, the next obvious question is, who is the dragon? We kind of already uh, figured it out already earlier, but who is the dragon, and where was he cast out to? Well, notice what the verse says in Revelation 12, verse 9. It says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the who, everyone? The devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Who does the dragon represent, everyone? Satan or the devil, and where was he cast out? He was cast out unto the earth. He was cast out unto the earth. He is cast out out of heaven and into this earth. Now, we need to ask our, ourselves a, a good, another question. Well, before we get that, here's the recap. The dragon represents the devil and Satan, and he was cast from heaven and cast to the earth with his angels. All right, here's the next question. Why did Satan go into war with Michael? Why did Satan want to go fight Jesus? Anybody would know? Notice what Ezekiel chapter 28 says. It says here, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of what, everyone? Perfection. This is speaking of Lucifer. Full of wisdom and full in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was of your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. 
the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. That phrase, uh, workmanship of your timbrels and pipes, just, just simply refers to, to Lucifer being one of the most musical, talented angels in all of heaven. In fact, he was the chief musician in all of heaven. Now it goes on to say, you were the anointed what everyone? Cherub. What is a cherub? It's an angel who covers. What was the cherub covering? Remember the sanctuary in the most holy place? What is in the most holy place? The Ark of the Covenant. And what is on the top of the Ark of the Covenant? You have cherubims covering God's law or the mercy seat, God's presence. And in the middle of them, you have God's uh, Shekinah glory, His presence. This is referring to uh, Lucifer being one of the most highest angels in heaven, being the cherubim, um, the cherubim angel in the sanctuary of God. This means to say that Lucifer was one of the angels who was the most closest to Jesus. Does that make sense, everyone? He was the most closest to Jesus. And then it goes on. I establish you. That's God establishing Lucifer. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in, in your ways from the day you were created till what, everyone? Iniquity was found in you. Question. Did God create the devil? According to this verse, who did God create? An angel, a perfect angel. He created a perfect angel. And it says, you are perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now we need to ask ourselves the question, what is this iniquity about? Why did he have iniquity in his heart? Was iniquity a choice of Lucifer, or was iniquity a, a force from God? Well, we're going to find out in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Notice what the Bible says. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O who, everyone? Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart. Now, notice this list. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the who, everyone? The Most High is referring to Jesus. Who did Satan want to be like? He wanted to be like Jesus, but I want you to notice something. He wanted to be like Jesus, not in character. He wanted to be like Jesus because of his position. Does that make sense, everyone? Meaning to say, he did not want the character of God, which was love. He wanted more so the position or the authority of God. If that's clear, please say amen. Because he wanted to be like the Most High, and he was jealous of God's position. This is, this is why he wanted to fight Michael. Because also, sin originated in the heart of Lucifer. He was, Lucifer just simply means light bearer, which turned him into Satan, deceiver. That, that word Satan just simply means deceiver or enemy because he had iniquity. He was envious of God. And he wanted the position of God rather than the what, everyone? The character of God. You know, today, when we say, or when we sing the song, I would be like Jesus, when we sing that song, we're not saying that we want to be like Jesus to have the position of God. We're singing that song because we want to be like Jesus to have the character of God, which is love. God is love. Does that make sense, everyone? Satan did not want the character of God. He wanted the position and authority of God. Why? Why did he want that? If you notice in this verse, he wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to have his throne above the stars of God. He wanted to basically be God. 
He wanted worship. He wanted to be not just like God, but he wanted to be God. That's what was in the heart of Lucifer, which then, as a result, turned into Satan. Now, next question. How was the devil successful in deceiving God's angels? How was the devil successful in deceiving God's angels? How many of the angels, by the way, did Satan uh, take from heaven? It's a third, right? According to Revelation chapter 12, you can look at uh, verse 4. He took a third of the angels uh, from heaven. And then notice what it says in, in 12 verse 4. It says that his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. How did he deceive? By the way, what does the stars represent? Remember we studied this before? Stars represent messengers or angels. Angelos, right? His tail drew a third of the stars. How did Satan deceive the stars or the angels of heaven? Through his, his tail. Now we need to ask this most powerful question is what does the tail represent? What does the tail represent? According to Isaiah 9 verse 15, it says, the elder and honorable, he is the head, the prophet who teaches what everyone? Lies, he is the? How did, this, how did the devil deceive the angels in heaven, a third of the angels? Through his, through his tail, which represents his, his lies, meaning he was a false prophet. Now, what were these lies about? What was the lies that he told in, in heaven to deceive one-third of the angels? The tale represents the lies of a prophet. Satan used lies to deceive the angels, the angels in heaven. Now, before we go to that next question, how did Satan deceive one-third of the angels? Of obviously, it tells us in Scripture that he, he, he said lies. And what were those lies about? It had to be lies against the character of God. Does that make sense, everyone? Because he was fighting against Michael. It had to be lies that were totally against God. Now, we don't really understand how he uh, took down the angels in heaven or what specific lies were there. The only way we can fully understand how he lied to the angels in heaven is if we first answer this question. What did the serpent do on earth when he was cast out from heaven. Meaning to say, when you can understand how Satan tries to deceive or tries to, to share lies about God to humanity, then you can properly understand how he deceived the angels up in heaven. If that makes sense, please say amen. Okay, so now what we need to understand is how did he deceive humans? How did he deceive, deceive Adam and Eve here on earth. Well, there's this story in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1 through 6. Notice what Scripture tells us. Verse 1. Now the who, everyone? Who is the serpent represent? Satan, right? And the devil. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? How many of us are familiar with this story in Genesis chapter 3? Okay, so notice what did Satan do? What did the serpent say to the woman? Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So he's making this question and he's saying, didn't God say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And notice what she responds by. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Question, did Eve, <clears throat> did Eve say exactly what God had said to them in the garden? How do we know that? What did God actually say to Eve? What did God say to Eve? If you have your Bibles, I didn't put this on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And looking at verse... Uh, 
look at verse 8 and 9. I'm sorry, verse 16. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Out of, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So this is what God had said to Adam and Eve. Now, what did, how did, how did the woman respond back to the serpent? Did she misquote God's words? Yes, she did. She said, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you what, everyone? Touch it. Did God say, did God mention anything about touching the fruit? What did Eve do? She added to the Word of God. And when you add to the Word of God, you're in deep kimchi or pad thai, not the noodles. When you add to the Word of God, or when you take away from the Word of God, you are in deep pad thai kimchi noodles. Oh, where did that come from? Okay, so <laughs> this is what happens when you add to the Word of God, and when you, don't, when you forget the words of God, and notice, in verse 1, in verse 1, it says, The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. And then it says, And he said to the woman. What does it mean that he said to the woman? The serpent spoke. Now, if I were you, what would you do if you heard a serpent or a snake speak to you? What would you do? You most likely would run away, right? You wouldn't just speak back, hey, hey, serpent, how's it going? You, you wouldn't do that, right? I mean, who would do that? Only Eve kind of, kind of, she kind of did that, right? Unfortunately. The moment when we start to speak back to Satan is where the moment Satan has got us in his trap. The moment Satan tries to speak to us tries to speak to us even with God's word. And the, the word that Satan used here, the serpent that, that God used, I mean, the words that God used here was that, has God indeed said, Satan quotes scriptures. Does that make sense, everyone? Satan can come at us by quoting scriptures, and it may sound good. It may what, everyone? It may sound good, but we need to base everything that we hear on a thus saith of the Lord. Can you say amen? So now the woman begins to interact with this serpent, and then all of a sudden the serpent starts to say, uh, the woman starts to say, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, she mentions the word, touch it, and then lest you die. Now notice what he says. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will what? You will not surely die. Here we see in this verse, did you know that in this verse, we have here the first time that Satan begins to preach a sermon on the immortality of the soul. How many of us have ever heard of immortality of the soul? Basically, the idea that when you die, you basically don't go to the grave, you go to heaven. This is actually the first sermon that Satan has ever preached to, uh, to Eve, and she said, you will not surely die. Now notice the next verse. Notice, for God knows, this is his reasoning, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be what, everyone? Open. What is, what is, she, what is the serpent saying to, to, to Eve? Basically, Eve, your eyes are not, are not open. Your eyes are closed. You can't see. <clears throat> she, he says, your eyes will be open and you will be like who, everyone? like God. Now, when we, when we studied about Satan, he wanted to be like God, not for the character of God, but for what purpose, everyone? The position of God. Notice how she, he's, he's basically saying this to, to Eve, you're going to be like God. You're going to have the position of God. Does that make sense, everyone? And when you have that position of God, you will know good and evil, meaning to say that Eve, you have an opportunity to be a God. Eve, you have an opportunity to open your eyes. Eve, your eyes are shut, it's closed, and you don't know what good and evil is like. 
Satan was appealing to her senses. Now notice what, what it says next. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the what, everyone? The eyes and a tree desirable to make one what, everyone? Wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And she said, Kain na tayo. Right? She said, let's eat. The woman was mesmerized by what the serpent has said because the serpent made the fruit look so appealing, look so attractive that she looked at it and she said, you know what? It's good for food. Meaning, it's good for my, my belly. I can eat it. And it was pleasant to my eyes. It looks good. It sounds good. It, it probably tastes good. And then this tree is desirable to make her wise. Satan appeals to her senses. And this is true to, the, to our day today. This is how Satan tries to steer, steer us off the path of God. He tries to present something that is good for food. How many of us like food? He presents to us something that is pleasant to the eyes. How many of us like looking good? That looks good to the eyes. Likes things that are look, looking good to the eyes. How many of us also likes to be wise? Satan puts these things in front of us each and every day. And he says, just eat. Eat of wisdom. Eat of food. And eat of prettiness. And I will give you everything that I have. And then it says, she took of its fruit and ate. And then she said, kain na tayo, let's eat. Right? Okay. Now, this is, what, this is the, the summary. He tempted and deceived Eve, who later caused Adam to sin. And because of this humanity, is, and because of this, humanity is now in a sinful, fallen state. Adam and Eve represented humanity, and as a result, since then, now there is chaos in this world. Now, we need to ask this next question. But what did God do the moment Adam and Eve sinned? What did God do, everyone? According to Genesis 3, verse 7 and 8, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed, what, everyone? Fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. What happened to them in this verse? They saw that they were naked. And as a result, they sewed fig leaves together to make coverings for themselves. In other words, to have a shirt, to have clothing. Now, the reason why they did this was because they saw each other naked. They were shameful of how they looked. And as a result, they went to find fig leaves in order to cover up. Have you ever tried to cover up before, after you had sinned? This is what Adam, this is where we get the idea of covering up our sins. Have you ever sinned before and then you did something to cover it up? I see no hands. I'm sure we, most of us have covered up our sins before. We try to sometimes justify what we have done as saying, ah, it's not sinful. I could do that. I could do this. And most of the times, this is exactly how we feel. We, whenever we sin, we try to cover up. Now notice what happens in the next verse. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, what did they do, everyone? Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Isn't this amazing? That the moment Adam and Eve sinned, God went to pursue them. Amen? God went in pursuit of his fallen creature, his fallen creation, Adam and Eve. Now, I want to share with you something um, real quick. You know, just making this practical, I, I used to, how many of us have ever experienced the world before? Or how many of us are experiencing the world today? I hope not. I hope we're not experiencing the world today. But if you are, I want to share with you a testimony. You see, before, I, I shared this before, before, I used to be in the world. I joined the military, the United States Army, for four years, served the country, um, and by God's grace, I mean, not by God's grace, but I chose out of my own free will to just join the military, and I, 
I wanted to find happiness. I wanted to find freedom because growing up in home, I, was, I had a tug of war between my mom and my dad. It was like a great controversy in my own home. You see, my mom was Adventist and my father was Catholic. And my father, he was a Marine. He, he was a military child growing up. And he was very influential in wanting me to become uh, in the military, to join the military. And as a result, guess who I listened to? I listened to my dad. I joined the military and I was in the world and I realized that this world was empty. This world had nothing good for me to, to, to enjoy. All the things that I tried to, to find happiness was giving me hardships, heartaches, and making me poor and poor. And it came to a point where I got so poor that I was down to my last $100. That's like um, 5,000 pesos here. And I looked at my bank account and I was like, Lord, what am I doing? I dropped to my knees. Long story short, I cried out to God. I said, God, please help me. Forgive me for, wrong, for wandering away. Have you ever experienced that Jonah wandering away from, from God moment? This was my moment. I ran away from God. And as a result, I was empty. I, was, I wasn't happy. And when I made that prayer, when I cried out to God, within one hour, this friend of mine is by the name of Taj Pakleb. How many of us have ever heard of Taj Pakleb? Okay, a lot of people. A Taj Pakleb calls me up and he says, Hey man, I want to invite you to a Daniel and Revelation seminar. How, now, how many of us have ever heard of a Daniel Revelation seminar? How many of us have ever attended one? I was, I was privileged to be invited to a Daniel and Revelation seminar and I came the first night and I didn't understand what was going on on the screen. Like Taj was preaching his heart out and I was like, it doesn't make sense. And I, I kept coming and coming every single night. And at the end of it, as a result, I ended up giving my life to Jesus. Can you say amen? I ended up giving my heart to God and I said, Lord, I don't want the things of this world. I want Jesus. Give me Jesus. And not the power and the authority, but the character of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And by God's grace, I was rebaptized. I was baptized into the church, and I came back to God. And this message is is the message that God put on my heart to share with everyone here, uh, even to, to to today. And so I just want to share with you that if you're struggling with the things of this world, there is hope for you. Amen. If God could, could save a sinner, a wretched sinner just like me, how much more can God save each and every one of us in our sins that we struggle with? Amen? Now, with Adam and Eve, they were faced with doom. They were faced with destruction because the wages of sin is what, everyone? It's death. They had just sinned. And then Jesus, says to, and then Jesus comes to Adam and Eve and he, he begins to tell them a promise. He says, I'm going to give you something special. And this is that, that special promise. He says in Genesis 3.15, speaking to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and who, everyone? The woman. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. If you get a moment, I want you to please study this verse out. This is a messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy that points us to the Messiah, that's Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? This was the prophecy, this was the messianic prophecy that God gave to Adam and Eve when they sinned. And we don't have the time to break down the whole entire prophecy. This is actually one of the first prophecies of the entire scripture in Genesis 3.15. But basically, this is what God is saying to, here, to Adam and Eve. I'm going to put enmity. Enmity is perfect hatred. It's what everyone? Perfect hatred, that is war or great controversy. I'm going to put great controversy between you and the woman. Basically between Satan and the woman. And then it says, and between your seed, so Satan's seed or Satan's followers, Satan's angels, Satan's followers, and her seed. Who is her seed referring to? Notice it's capitalized. That, that capitalized seed is referring to Jesus. That's the Messiah, everyone. I'm going to put a great controversy between Satan and the woman, between Satan's children and the woman's children, which is the seed, that's Jesus. 
And then it says, He, speaking of the seed, Jesus, shall bruise your what, everyone? Your head. Does, how do you kill a serpent? You kill it by the tail? How do you kill a serpent? You kill it by the head. Jesus will bruise your head. He will kill the head of the serpent. And then it says, and you, Satan, shall bruise his heel. Bruising his heel was, was symbolic of Jesus being crucified. But we're given good news because when Jesus was crucified, did Jesus resurrect from the dead? Yes, he did. He resurrected so that he could be our king and our savior. Can you say amen? This was good news to Adam and Eve because they were told by God that one day a Messiah would come. Jesus would come to destroy sin, Satan, death, and all the things of evil in this world. Can you say amen? And Adam and Eve was looking forward to that day when Jesus would come on the, at the cross and die for all of humanity, but not just die, but also resurrect. Now, notice what Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Let's read this on the screen. It says here, The goodness of God leads us to repentance. Did Adam and Eve repent? Eventually they did, amen? Because they saw the goodness of God, they saw that a Messiah would come. And as a result, God also took away their fig leaves and he clothed them with what, everyone? Tunics of skin. Does anybody know what that reference is? The tunics of skin means that a, a lamb had to die. An animal had to die. It represented the sacrifice of Jesus. Okay. How many of us want Jesus in our lives? Amen? Now, in Genesis chapter 3, we also saw that God pursued Adam and Eve. God told them that he would one day destroy Satan through the death of Jesus. And then God then clothed them with tunics of skin representing Christ's atonement for sin. Now, the last question that we have is, since the messianic promise in Genesis 3.15, how has the great controversy affected the human race? How has the great controversy affected us even to today? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 through 24, it says, this is a summary, humanity would suffer from sorrow, birth pains, I'm sorry, women, you guys will have to, sorry, have to go through birth pains, hard labor, this is for the guys and girls too, Curse, <laughs> cursed earth, sweat, how many of us like sweating? You can thank Adam and Eve for sweating. Tears, nobody likes crying. Decaying plants and animals and even what everyone, and even death. This is as a result of that great controversy or this is a result of sin that took place with Adam and Eve. Because of their sin, now it results in suffering for the entire human world. And also, we saw in Genesis 4, verse 1 to 15, that Cain killed his brother Abel. Seth is born. So there's this great controversy. Death, life, death, life, killing, life, resurrection, death, life. There is this constant battle from, from um, history all the way to now, even to today. Is there still death today? Yeah. In this controversy, in this great controversy, we must understand this very important part. Whoever controls the mind controls your thoughts, actions, and feelings. If you control these things, it leads to our habits. Habits form into character, and character determines, meaning to say, whoever has control of your mind, that is where you will be. If Christ is in control of your mind, guess who you'll be with in the end? We'll be with Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. Now in this world, we see that the, the God of this world, the enemy, Satan, has blinded the minds of them, but, gospel, but, but Jesus has given us the gospel of Christ to shine into our hearts. Last question before we go. How will the great controversy end? How will the great controversy end? According to Revelation 19, verse 1 and 2, and Revelation 20, sinners 
will be destroyed in the presence of God, known as the lake of what, everyone? The lake of fire is simply the destruction of evil, the destruction of Satan, the destruction of, of Satan and his angels. Evil men, death will be destroyed, and the earth will be cleansed from sin again. Can you say amen? The destruction of sin, Satan, evil angels, and wicked people. God's people now can enjoy a perfect home without temptation and a tempter. How many of us want to experience that someday, amen? How many of us want to experience a life without death, without sin, without crying, without tears, without sweating, without labor pains? How many of us want to experience that? It's, it's, if that's your desire, please stand with me as we close in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much, Father, for being victorious tonight. Father, even though the enemy was attacking us through the, the strong winds and rains, Lord, Father, we're so thankful, Lord, that you are here to calm the storm. And you are, to, you are here to give light to the message about the great controversy. Oh, Father in heaven, we wish, I wish I had the time to, to do further study into the great controversy. But Father, I pray, Lord, that the things that we learn is important, was important for us for our salvation. Because we know, Lord, that one day you will wipe away every tears from our eyes. You will remove sin, death, Satan, and evil angels from our presence. This earth would be cleansed, and Jesus would be our Savior. Oh, Father in heaven, help us to get to know Jesus better, to get to know him as our best friend, and to experience his love given to us at the cross. This is our humble prayer, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Let everyone say Amen.